don't know if I got this on or not. Let me double check. Check. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, there it is. That's better. Well, I hope everyone's had a wonderful weekend. As you can see, I'm sporting my coat again. That's right. But I have a t-shirt underneath, so it kind of cancels it out. That's kind of neat. Um, really excited about today's message, uh, something that, it, that the Lord has been showing me all week. And then, of course, yesterday he just kind of reveals new things to me through it. And I'm going to have to get very um, transparent with you this morning. And I do this because I trust that you won't make fun of me. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Remember to embrace those who are hurting. Uh, because there was a moment yesterday when I was hurting really bad. <laughs> now, I know what many of you are thinking, yeah, you saw the score to the game too, but I'm not talking about that. <laughs> However, I will point out that the score was 66 to 6, and that is satanic. <laughs> I think what is going on in our team can only come out through prayer and fasting. <laughs> so, maybe we should do that. Anyway. Unique events happened this week, and I'm really amazed uh, to see how quickly our culture is changing. Really, really changing. And I'm kind of a history buff, and so one of the things I really enjoy is to try to find out and learn more about the history of, well, America. Where we live, the land of the free and the home of the brave. And I'm becoming to understand that what we began to be, we have no longer become that. Through generation, through generation, through generations, things change. And a lot of that is because we refuse to continue on what was started before us. Maybe we've been hurt before in the past. Therefore, we'll say, I'll never be like them. And it's so funny because in my life there's been many times in my teenage years up to my young adult years that I watched my parents and I said, I will never be like that. <laughs> then you have children. <laughs> and then you realize that's why they were that way. <laughs> and pretty soon you realize, man, I have become what I once despised. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Pretty soon your parents, you know what, they're pretty smart. Because in my 20s, they didn't know what they were talking about. But as I got older and had kids, I realized, man, there were some things that they had learned in their existence before I even showed up. It was a huge epiphany to me to realize that the world did not revolve around me. What? And my children are going to find this out too. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Spare the rod, spoil the child. Hold on to the rod, you'll get entertained. Can I get an amen? <laughs> Yesterday was a very amazing moment for me. And it did happen at the football game. But what was really amazing, it has nothing to do with football. But it's what I witnessed that took place at Jones AT&T <laughs> Stadium at 11 o'clock in the morning. Me and my dad go to every home game, and it's been a tough year for us. But we pray, and we praise the, the efforts of the team as they try to do the best they can. But something was different about yesterday. It was because it was the wounded warrior project was the emphasis of the beginning of the game. And I'm here to tell you, obviously, it meant so much to me, it engulfed the game or the lack thereof. <laughs> As they bring these four wounded soldiers out to the middle of the field, I begin to get choked up. They bring this this man who had evidently taken some explosives and, and it had changed his life forever. And then to see one who, 
who didn't look like he had had really any injuries, but somehow he's had 27 surgeries, and another one had lost a leg, and, and another one who looked completely okay. You don't even understand what they went through mentally, and he's wearing the Congressional Medal of Honor, and he rescued his team from fire and had to kill in order to do that. And I began to realize I will never experience that. I haven't even <laughs> witnessed that. But as I'm watching these four young men that they're saying this is who this is, it moves me to where I'm standing and I'm clapping and I am starting to tear up because of the price that these men and women have paid for our country. Then I begin to get convicted because I take advantage of that freedom every day. And pretty soon I'm trying to compose myself because it just looks weird that I'm bawling my head off. It's like somebody wants to look at me and go, do you know them? No. <laughs> Smooth by it. And pretty soon here, here behind the wounded vets are these people in suits and, and they're the people that build a brand new house for a wounded vet every year. And so they have all four of them lined up and they reveal the one who gets the house built free and clear for them. <coughs> and then this guy falls apart. I wish we could build one for everyone that has suffered. And to watch this guy be so gracious for the love that they were showing him, now I'm really crying. And at this point, they hug each other and, and they walk off the field. And, and as they walk off the field, they, they all go to the sideline and here comes the reporters and they're trying to interview this guy, but he can't quit crying. And, and I'm still crying because I'm watching them, but everybody's like, all right, let's get to football. And I'm like, Man, forget this football. This is something amazing that's happening. And Man, thank God that there's people in place to say, you know what, we're going to honor our wounded vets here at this gathering of, of people who want to watch a football game. <laughs> Next thing you know, here comes a really amazing point in a football game. It's the coin toss. And it's very symbolic because you get four of your top guys and four of the opposing team's top guys. They meet out in the middle of the field and they stand off to each other while they flip the coin. And as they call for the athletes to come down, you notice that none of the tech athletes are moving, but they sent out the four wounded vets. And to watch them go to our opposition and to watch our opposition just say, man, thank you. And hug them. And God, man, it just meant the world to me. So there I am again. <laughs> My dad's looking at me like, boy, do you need a coat or something? <laughs> Not to mention that they start playing the, the national anthem and I got my hand over my heart and I'm crying, the flag's going up, the jets come by. <laughs> And I'm just like, yo, I cannot compose myself, man. I am just bawling. And then we begin to have this football game. <laughs> it's the only time I was able to compose myself because my attitude was, eh, figures. <laughs> then halftime came, and I'm excited because... Something unique happens at the beginning of the third quarter. I get up from my seat and I go get a hamburger with french fries. Praise God. <laughs> I've absolutely been able to compose myself and the band's playing a, a bunch of patriotic songs. And all of a sudden the band gets done with the song and they're all in their marching place. And everybody stopped. And, and about that time you uh, hear the announcer say, ladies and gentlemen, the Texas Tech Red Raider Band would like to play Amazing Grace. And you would have thought you could hear a pin drop when everyone got quiet. And they played it so soft to the point that people all around me began to stand up and praise God. And as they were playing, the flag girls went and grabbed crosses and marched out in the middle of the field. 
Needless to say, And it was the senior game, and so the seniors, it was the last time they were going to play, and that made me most of them. And here's the band, and all of a sudden the band gets done playing, and they come off the field, and only a few other band people go all the way out to the field, and there's only a handful of them. I'm like, man, what's going on? And here they go. They say, here's the seniors, and this will be the last time they play at home. And it's just a few people, and they begin to play in March. And the rest of the band goes up to them and begins to salute them as they go off. And I'm crying again. <laughs> if that wasn't enough, as they're marching down the middle, a soldier in full uniform comes out into the middle of while they are marching. Grabs a girl and hands her instrument to somebody else and marches her to the middle of the field, gets down on one knee and proposes. Oh, yeah. 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 There I am just. Oh, yeah. I got snot. Um, my wife at that time had called and I want to answer, I love you so much. Next thing you know, my wife tells me, you should have seen what they did at the Penn State game. And I said, don't tell me because I am beside myself. <laughs> I do not know if you're aware of what has been going on in Penn State College, but there's been a scandal where a coach, not the head coach, but a coach had been molesting 10-year-old boys for many, many years. And man, it is done. Was not the players' fault. They had nothing to do with it. However, they have got to go on without their coach, who had been the coach of our nation. They had let him go, and rightly so. But as they came out, they're playing Nebraska, which Nebraska has left the Big 12. They're in this new conference, and, and they really don't know how to handle this. It's really odd. And, and you watch the team of Penn State come out, and they're not busting through the tunnel and going, yeah, let's get up. They went arm in arm, and they marched slowly as a team. And as they got to their sideline, both teams met in the middle, and everyone kneeled down. And they begin to pray for the victims. Maybe one of the first times in my life yesterday I saw that our entertainment of college football is put back in its place of importance. We begin to realize that life is more than just this. And I need to say this. If you are a veteran and have served in any capacity for our nation, please stand. for this, but I know you can't stand, brother, but I know the price you paid. I say with everyone else, Reese and to all of our veterans, thank you very much. And I will say on behalf of my wife and my kids, and I'm sure I can say this for everyone here, we will do our best to honor the freedom that you have fought so dearly for. Amen. You guys may be seated. In this Wounded Warrior Project, it, it makes you realize, and as we thank our veterans for all the price that they've paid, that, man, life is very precious. And it is of utmost value. And we begin to understand that Whenever you look at your child or whenever you get to look at a friend or a family member or the every day that you get up and are able to look at yourself in the mirror, it is because somebody has paid a price. Then we begin to understand the price 
that Jesus paid for us to have true life. Give me an amen. amen. I'm excited because there is something unique about witnessing things. I am forever changed on what I witnessed yesterday. I know that I've told you about what I witnessed, but that may not be able to affect you as much as it affected me. Right now we are live in a, a, a nation where the media is very, very amazing. For instance, there's really nothing that's hidden anymore. Uh, every September 11th, we get to see over and over again planes that ran into a tower and we continue to gasp as we watch it every year. But I'm here to tell you, you really haven't witnessed it unless you were there. That's when you witness something. And I really try to think, I try to think about what it would have been like if all of a sudden you're going through your everyday routine and then life changes right in front of you. When you witness something, it changes who you are. Our veterans, we've, we've seen people get shot at and shot on TV all the time. However, I'll never look at my veteran and go, I know how you feel, man. I saw the documentary on A&E. It's like I experienced World War II. Uh, no, Travis, the only way you can truly experience World War II is when you're in a foxhole, bullets are flying around, and you're crying out to God for safety. Definitely a witness to that. So there's power in being a witness. And we find Jesus in John chapter 8 verses 31 through 47 trying to explain this to people who do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. It's an amazing dispute that happens, amazing debate that happens between Jesus and the religious leaders. So John chapter 8 verse 31 says this. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Everyone say amen. amen. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family. But a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, yet you are looking for a way to kill me because you have no room for my word. I'm telling you what I've seen in my father's presence. And you are doing what you have heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they answered. If you were Abraham's children, Jesus said, then you would do what Abraham did. As it is, you are looking for a way to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Abraham did not do such things. You are doing the works of your own father. We are not illegitimate children, they protested. The only father we have is God himself. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I have come here from God. I have not come on my own. God sent me. Why is my language not clear to you? Because you are unable to hear what I say. You belong to your father, the devil. And you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth. For there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native tongue. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? If I am telling the truth, why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God, here's what God says. The reason you do not hear is that you do not belong to God. Man, Jesus is really being offensive right here. How dare he say that about? Here's these religious leaders that say, Jesus, you don't understand who we are. We are the descendants of Abraham. You know what I'm saying? We don't have to be slaves to anybody. We've never been slaves. We're free. God's our father. We are descendants from the great Abraham. And man, Jesus says, you are not descendants of Abraham. You are not the children of God. I can imagine that there was one of those moments where these guys got together and said, who does this guy think he is? 
I mean, you want me to prove it? I'm a descendant of Abraham? He says, if you were a descendant of Abraham, you would be like Abraham. If you were truly a, a, a child of Abraham, somebody who knows about Abraham, then you would absolutely understand that I am the son of God. However, you're trying to find a way to kill me. And then I love what Jesus says. Don't you guys get it? I didn't come from Abraham. Abraham came from me. I came from the Father. I have witnessed things from the Father, and now I am here to share it with you, but you won't even see it because you're not of God. <coughs> I'm sorry if you guys don't see what's going on here. There are some fighting words happening here. What would happen today if a foreign enemy came to America and said, you are no longer free? I know what would happen in Texas. <laughs> Everybody would be going home because they got a God-given right. <laughs> We're going to kill them all. We'll show them who's free. <laughs> Do you not realize that Jesus is a witness of God? He is a witness of himself. Notice this in John chapter 1. This is a beautiful scripture. It says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. Amen. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness. As one who had seen things. A witness to testify concerning the light so that through him... All might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. <laughs> Verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Everyone say amen. 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 Children born not of natural descent, not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, let me paint this picture for you guys about Jesus. Jesus was not this far out hippie who figured some things out. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. Go ahead. Because <laughs> many of our pictures of Jesus, I expect Jesus in the picture to go far out, man. <laughs> Make love, not war. He's a lot bigger than what we can imagine. It's amazing to me that here Jesus comes to earth and he leaves his deity and he comes to earth and he's going to show us what God looks like. Do we get that? Because many times we read in our scriptures and we debate our scriptures and we try to figure out what it looks like. And then what happens is we, we create division because, well, this translation says this thing and it means this to me. But this translation means this to me. Therefore, if we can't agree on what it is, then we must separate and be divided. And the enemy goes, yes. You want to know what Christianity is all about, ladies and gentlemen? I will give you the answer. Jesus. That's it. Oh, come on, Pastor Travis. Really? I mean, we, I've seen all the A&E specials on Jesus. I've, I've seen all As a matter of fact, I've had people that represented Jesus to me. And if Jesus is like them, I don't want any part of them. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Man, we screw that up a lot. How was Jesus on this earth? 
loved well. He did not condemn, but he forgave. The most beautiful thing that I've seen about Jesus, and I learn more every day, is that he always saw each person as who they were made to be. The woman caught in adultery before Jesus. Where are those who condemn you? They're not here. Neither do I condemn you. Go, sweetheart. Sin no more because that's who you are. Oh, but Jesus, I'm a prostitute. I keep messing up. I'm horrible. I can't do anything right. And Jesus says, yes, you can because you were created for such a thing. Let it get real quiet in here because there's many people in this room going, not me. I am the world's greatest screw up. I've tried walking with Jesus, Travis, and I can't do it. To those of you in this room that are here that say that I say welcome, because you are amongst brothers and sisters who are the same. Amen. Amen. I can't do it without him. All I can do is get to know him. <laughs> Many times in my life, I have been a very vocal activist to what I thought was right. And it's one thing to sit here and have an opinion, but then it's another thing when you speak to somebody who's actually experienced what you have an opinion on. Right. For instance, what it's like to be in war. Since this is Veterans Weekend, I'll, I'll discuss that. Everything changed for me when I sat down and talked to Reese. It's another thing when you sit down with somebody who is... Who's experienced more and said, all right, dude, what's it like really? Tell me. And then he begins to tell you pretty soon you realize your opinion stinks. And you begin to change. Because how are you going to tell a veteran that is lost, a veteran that, is, that has been there and say, I know better than you. However, we do this to Jesus all the time. Jesus says, I've come to set you free. If I set you free, you are free indeed. Thank you, Jesus. However, I want to keep these chains on. Lock them up tight. And Jesus says, why do you have those chains on? And you say, because I like them. <laughs> and how many times in our life do we sit there? And we say, Lord, take these chains off of me. And he goes to the combination lock. And he undoes the lock. And he says, there, you're free. And you go, man, how did you do that? And you lock yourself back up. <laughs> That's it. And it never fails that when all of a sudden God takes off all of our chains that we're walking in freedom and everything's wonderful, but then all of a sudden we feel like we need to go to the chain shop. Why are you going to the chain shop? I don't know. I just like chains. <laughs> Pretty soon you're locked up worse than you were from the beginning. Here's the reason why. It would be best if we went to the locksmith Jesus and said, take these chains off, which he does. But once he takes the chains off, we're free to go. But what we should be saying is, wow, I want to hang out with you. If I hang out with a guy who can break all the chains, then I probably won't get chained up again. Can I get an amen? amen. And any time the enemy brings the chains, you tap the locksmith on the shoulder. Jesus turns around and says, no, get back. I got this one. Snap. What would happen, ladies and gentlemen, if you were so chained up and Jesus comes up and breaks your chains and Jesus says, come follow me. And you say, man, I'm going to follow you. Is there not a moment in your life that you might sit there and go, hey, Jesus, can we go to my family's house? I would really love for you to come hang out with me and my friends because some of my friends are chained up. And you know what Jesus would say? He would say, I don't associate with those people. <laughs> What's really sad is we laugh. That's what we've done as Christians. We get our chains taken off and act like we're better than somebody who's chained up. And we say we walk with Christ. But the truth <laughs> is, Jesus is the great locksmith. And locksmiths love to go to places where there are locks. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus says, salvation is my business, and business is good. Surely, Jesus, you wouldn't be caught with sinners. That's what I am all about. Because 
Because if I set them free, they are free indeed. Notice that Jesus had witnessed who God was. As a matter of fact, and I won't read it in length, but in, in John chapter 5, verses 19 through 23, we see that Jesus is speaking to other Sadducees and Pharisees, and he says, I do nothing without seeing my Father in heaven do it first. I can do nothing by myself, but I only do what I see my Father in heaven doing. I only say what I hear my Father in heaven saying. You realize, wait a second, was Jesus' power limited? Oh, I'm sorry, it was unlimited through God. But notice what Jesus was doing. He was walking this earth while he was hanging out with his daddy. As a matter of fact, every day he got up, he went to the garden and said, Dad, you up yet? His dad's like, uh, Jesus, I don't have to have sleep. Remember, you're there, I'm here. Let's go. Pretty soon God would say, see that blind man? Yes, sir, I do. Spit on the ground, touch his eyes. All right? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> That's what my father said. Pop, pop. I can see. Everybody's, oh, Jesus did this. And he says, through the father. I am the son. Even to the point where he went and raised a dead man to life. Even to the point where he was crucified on the cross and God raised him from the dead and said, Son, I am so proud of you. Here's the keys. Here's the kingdom. It's all about your name and you glorify me. And Jesus says, I've got a lot of brothers and sisters, Dad, and I'm bringing them home. And God says, I ask my boy, go get my family. They're going to stay with me forever. He witnessed what his father did before he did it. And then in Acts chapter 3, we notice that after Jesus had died and had risen again, and the world celebrated his death because he was just really a teacher and a prophet, but he had no power. All of a sudden, a couple of his disciples come along. They see a guy who's crippled, and, and he's begging for money. And the two guys go, hey, we don't have any money, but I tell you what, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And the crippled guy's like, cool. Gets up, grabs his mat, and he starts walking around praising God. I can imagine what the authorities thought at this time. How is this possible? We killed Jesus. We proved that he was human. There's no supernatural ability in him. It's absolutely foolish that people followed him for three years. What is going on here? And his disciples are going, it's all about Jesus, man. You guys killed him. But here's what we saw Jesus do. This is what we witnessed Jesus do. We witnessed Jesus go, and we watched Jesus hear the Father, and we watched Jesus obey the Father, and when Jesus obeyed the Father, miracles happened. Can I get an amen? amen. And all of a sudden, the disciples said, hey, Jesus called us to teach and do everything that he showed us to do. Therefore, hey, there's a crippled guy. In the name of you, Jesus, who has done this over and over again for your glory, Get up and walk. And the man got up and walked. And then the leaders went, oh, my Lord, we did not kill him. We multiplied him. <laughs> now there's not one of them, but many of them. And the more and more they hear and obey, the more and more and more are born. And the more they grow. And pretty soon there's just a bunch of Jesus freaks walking around changing the world. This cannot happen. <laughs> How can we say that we are witnesses of Jesus? Has anybody ever seen Jesus? I mean, we see him in pictures. And what's amazing, in America, we draw him, and he's, he's not even a Jew. We draw him as a white dude. <laughs> Sometimes we'll see our snowboarders in the Olympics and go, man, dude, it's just like Jesus. <laughs> Who's witnessed Jesus? Man, follow me here. If you will open your eyes and see Jesus moving amongst us, we will see Jesus in each other. That we can be witnesses of. 
I've changed. My wife is a witness to that. And you can't tell her different. Why? Because she's seen it. So many people in here that I have watched God change your life. You may not be perfect, but you are alive and you are about your father's business. Can I get an amen? amen. I've seen that change. So when people may come up to me and say, you know what, Travis, that little church thing that you're running, that you and Alan are doing, it really isn't going to last. I just sit there and say, oh, well, I just hope it does. And I don't have to debate. You know why? Because I see what God is doing here through you. I don't even have to tell what God is doing. What's so unique is if somebody comes to me and says, you prove Jesus to me or I'll never follow him. I'll go here. Talk to them. What are they going to do, Travis? Lead them in the sinner's prayer? Are they going to give them a sermon that's going to change their life? Hallelujah. <laughs> Only if we take offering. Amen, Pastor Allen? <laughs> the witness is going to say, this is what God has done in my life life. I used to be this, but I don't do that anymore. How did that happen? I don't know. <laughs> it's Jesus. We see Jesus every day in each other. Notice this, that you are a witness of Christ before man. You're not preachers. Everyone say Amen. amen. <laughs> You're witnesses. You, you're living examples of, of Jesus. You're, you're being changed before people that knew you one way before. Everywhere you walk, you're an example of Jesus. And, and people may look at you that you've never known before and you don't know how this happens. But all of a sudden, you'll bump into somebody at the grocery and they'll look at you and you'll say, excuse me. And they'll say, oh my gosh, aren't you so-and-so? Yeah, do I know you? No, you don't know me. But I used to sit there and think that you'd end up in jail. What happened? Well, I did end up in jail. Okay, and then you'll say, but I'm changed now. Or you'll meet a stranger and something will happen and you'll spark it up. And next thing you know that Jesus will have moved and you'll never know it, but you'll go back home going, I just had an experience with Jesus and a stranger. And we go, well, how does this happen? And great pastors like me and Alan will write a book to show you how this happens. <coughs> And you know what? Let's have 10, no, let's have 12 steps so that it can be just like the AA stuff. Amen? Amen. Then we'll really sell it. <laughs> How does it happen, Travis? How do you walk with God? What does it look like? I'm going to tell you this right now. It's Jesus, man. It's just Jesus. Well, Travis, how do I start walking with Jesus? I'll give you an amazing epiphany. Just sit down in your chair tonight at home, turn your TV off for a second, and just go, Jesus. Then what? I mean, I don't know. That's yours and his walk. But just know this. You call on him, he's there. I don't care if you feel it. He's there. I long for the day because as we recognize the fact that we are witnesses for Christ amongst men, do you realize that while you're doing that, Jesus is a witness of you before God? I love that. Those moments where that makes sense. You don't understand. You don't know what's going on. You, you, you go, Lord, you have to do something because I don't understand what's going on. Jesus is going, hey, God, check it out. And God's going, that's my daughter. That's my child right there. And the rest of the world may think you're nothing but a failure and you'll never amount to anything. Guess what? That's fine. But if you will love Jesus and be about your father's business, the king of kings and the Lord of lords will say, that's my child. I don't care what the world says. Those brothers and sisters of ours who've made wrong choices and have a lifetime in prison. That's truth. We have brothers and sisters who make bad choices and they have found themselves in a lifetime of prison. Do you not realize that within prison, if they will find Jesus Christ and their hearts be broken, that there will be a day when every door that binds them will be busted open. Amen. And Jesus will say, come forth. And then us religious people will say, how are they getting in heaven? They are murderers. And God will look at me and say, 
not near as bad a murderer traps as you are. Hold on a second, God. I have never killed anybody in my life. You have in your heart. Just like you're trying to murder him right now. Next thing you know, we begin to understand that if we are going to be witnesses of Jesus, we must be like Jesus. Today I'm really excited because we're about to have some baptisms. I know I'm running a little bit long, but God is good, amen? Amen. We have three baptisms today that I'm excited about, and you guys get to be witnesses of that. Can I get an amen? amen. Here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to ask Jordan to come back up, please. Let's lead us in a song as we get prepared for baptisms. Here's this understanding of being a witness. You may have never seen Jesus, but Jesus has obviously seen you. And he works through you so that you can live a life of him. And in doing so, he will say, you are witnesses of who I am. Make no mistake, if we will all embrace the fact that wherever we go, we are witnesses of our Father, we will see the Lord do amazing things in this city. You'll see the Lord do amazing things in your life. The thing is, we've got to walk with Jesus. Give me an amen. 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 Father, we thank you for our time together this beautiful, beautiful Mama. afternoon. Lord, what a wonderful occasion that we have to be a part of baptism between you and your child. <coughs> Father, we thank you so much that you loved us to send your son to die for us so that we can be called children of God. And Father, this day, there will be three that say, you are my dad. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. When Jesus was baptized, he said when he came out of the water, the Spirit of God ascended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son who I love, and I'm very pleased. Today, we'll experience something similar between a person and their father, God. And for this day, Jesus will say, these are my children. I love them, and I'm very pleased. Amen? Amen. First, we have Letitia. Come here, sweetheart. This is Letitia. She's a wonderful, little, beautiful girl. She's Tiffany DeGraff's little daughter. And I got to have a meeting with Letitia, and we discussed what baptism was all about. And today she is understanding that as she is baptized, the old is gone and the new has come. And she knows that God is her daddy. courageous. Do not be terrified. For the Lord your God will be with you everywhere you go. We give you this two things. Number one, remember that God will always be with you. But also that we stand as witnesses and we will stand with you wherever you may go. Okay? Amen.
Zach. This is Zach. I had a wonderful opportunity to speak with Zach, his aunt, and his uncle. I know many times in our life we'll do things because that's just what our family has done. I am very amazed at this young man. For this young man has sought out Christ. And in doing so, he has found the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And I'm very excited for this young man because the way he hears God is beautiful. And brother, I don't mean to put any pressure on anything, but I know that the Lord has amazing plans for you. And we need to continue to understand that and know that he is with you. Today, Zach is making the confession that he knows the Lord is his dad. And the old will be gone and the new has come. And brother, all of us in this place celebrate this day. God bless you guys for being a part of this. Let us go love well and be witnesses of Jesus Christ. You're now dismissed. Amen.